Everybody, welcome back from the uh, lunch break. Uh, let me introduce you to Hannah Donovan. She's a product designer and she will have a talk on how music and tech interfere. Yeah. Welcome, Hannah. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for waiting while we got that sorted out. I want to give um, a big round of applause to these amazing technicians that sorted that out for me. Thank you so much. Um, you would all be looking at like stretched designs if it wasn't for them, and nobody wants that, especially in a, de in a design talk. OK, so I see there's some people at the back. Come on up to the front. It's way better up here. You can hang out. We can chat. It's going to be fun. I see some stragglers. You guys are like, I don't know if I actually want to stay through this whole thing. That's cool. You can hang out at the back. I'm just saying there's some space up here. OK, so my name is Hannah Donovan, and I'm a product designer. And uh, I have currently, I'm working on a project called This Is My Jam, where I'm the co-founder and design director. But previous to that, I also led design at Last.fm, and I've also worked for some of these other companies here. And really, the reason that I do what I do is because I love making things that really create culture and nurture self-expression. That's what I'm interested in. So if that's what you're interested in, too, then this is the talk for you, and I hope you guys enjoy it. OK, some other highly important things that you need to know about me. My favorite film is Monsters, Inc. I play in a real orchestra that plays music like this in venues like that. And I also play in a comedy orchestra that plays music like this in venues like that as a cellist. Um, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is my favorite picture on the internet. I model all of my hairstyles off of these guys. OK, let's get started. So I want to start with a bit of a warning for you guys. <laughs> my warning is that. Music is really hard, okay? Product design for music is really difficult. Quick question, how many people in the room here, um, I see there's some more people coming in, so come on up, there's still some space at the front, it's really nice up here, I promise, it's good energy, come sit down. Um, how many people in here work in music or in music tech already? Okay, so like most of you guys, how many of you are designers? A few, okay, how many of you are developers? Some more? OK. What else? Who else is here? Just call out some of the things you do. Product, yeah. What else? User experience. Are there people like from the music industry proper here as well? They're like record label people. Yes, cool. Musicians, actual musicians. Amazing. OK, wonderful. Well, this is going to be a really diverse crowd. OK, so. Um, I should preface this by saying that this is all coming very much from a design perspective, so um, get ready to put your design hats on, and we're going to hopefully have lots of time for questions at the end, so if there's anything that goes too quickly, um, you can just stop me and we can, we can talk about it. I want this to be cozy. It's a conversation. Okay, so the reason music is really hard um, when it comes to consumer products, first of all, it's a super crowded space. If any of you have tried to make your own music products, you'll know that there's tons of competitors out there and they're literally popping up every single day and they're also disappearing every single day, which is, it's, it's scary. It's, it's a very crowded space. Secondly, you know, rightfully so, um, if you are a startup and you're working in music, it's something that a lot of investors are very wary of <laughs> for very good reasons. So that's another reason why it's difficult. Um, another thing about it is that there are a lot of constraints. And I don't need to tell you guys this. You know this probably better than anyone else. But there's lots of legal constraints. There's all sorts of constraints. And as a designer, these constraints are not your user's problem. So for instance, if you can only use like 30 second samples, you can't background YouTube on an iPhone, things like this, those UX problems, those are not your user's problems. They're your problems. You need to find a way around it and work within those constraints. But there's also a lot of gray areas. And that's one of the reasons that music is so exciting, because a lot of the companies that have really pushed the envelope and changed the industry in the last decade are people who have kind of played in those gray areas a little bit. And you definitely need to do this with caution. You need to really understand the rules and what you're doing. But if it wasn't for those gray areas and pushing the envelope a bit, we wouldn't be where we are today. And just think how far we've come since like the early 2000s with online music. 
And lastly here, <laughs> this, is, this is the motto from the Nautilus, um, uh, Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And uh, I discovered this when I was working on a little sort of hack project in December that we did at This Is My Jam. And this means moving in a moving thing. And I think that that is pretty much the perfect motto for the music industry online. Um, it's constantly changing, and you have to be constantly changing with it. All right, so I kind of approached this presentation, which is brand new, by the way. So thank you all for being my guinea pigs and listening to it for the very first time. <laughs> I'm actually not 100% sure how long it's going to run today, because this is the first time that I've given it. Um, but I approached this from the, the perspective of what do I wish I'd known when I started designing music products back in 2006? What are some of the things that I wish someone had sat me down and told me before I even got started um, making my first prototypes? And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. This is going to be dense. There's a lot of information. We're going to pack a lot in. Um, what I would love to know from you is, as an audience, do you guys like Q&A? Hands up. Who likes Q&A? Okay, like one person. Who doesn't really like Q&A? A few more people. Okay, so I'm also kind of on the fence about this. Personally, I'm not much of a Q&A person just because I find that the conversation tends to be much better in person. So here's what I'm going to do. We'll save some space at the end uh, for chats, and I'll be standing right up here, and if you want to come by and talk to me in person, we can do that too because that might be more fun than a big room Q&A, but we can also give that a shot too and see how it goes. Okay, so what do I wish I'd known? Well, <laughs> um, I wish I'd known that this project that I made in 24 hours at a hack day was going to be my most successful project of all time, other than Last FM, and this is my jam, things that I've pulled. Uh, this little thing here um, has had 80 million page views to date and went viral on Reddit and I basically made it while I was drunk. Um, I wish that someone had told me that, you know, you just can't choose what you're going to be known for. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've seen it. It might kill you. You should definitely use it with caution. It will tell you what to drink based on what you're listening to. Um, okay. All right. Jokes aside, what do I actually wish I'd known? Okay. Well, first of all, um, I wish I'd known about the toolkit for designing for music. Um, I'm a huge fan of toolkits. If anyone has ever heard me speak before, you'll know that this is something I put a lot of emphasis on as a designer, and you're going to find out why in a minute. So I'm going to teach you about the design toolkit. Um, I'm also going to talk to you about structure and designing for information, because the information design of music is very specific, and it's pretty different than a lot of other things out there. Um, I'm also going to talk about the context that surrounds music. This is another huge aspect of designing for it. Fourthly, we're going to dip into look and feel a little bit, everyone's favorite topic. And lastly, um, the triad of interactions for music, which is this listening, socializing and sharing, and discovering actions around music. So here we go. Let's get started. Tools. OK. So I want to just back up a little bit here with the tools, and I want to talk uh, historically for a second about the presentation of music products and music services and really anything out there that helped connect people to music and music culture, got fans interested, brought the music of artists to their audiences. So, you know, if we back this up like many years, a long time ago, you had things in the presentation bucket here, which were like magazines, you know, beautiful, glossy photos of artists and interviews with them and stuff like that. And we still have that today, which is great. And then in this sort of editorial bucket, another example here is stuff like radio shows, where there were these tastemakers that, you know, like John Peel, who totally connected with all of these fans in Britain in the 90s and brought them a sound that they hadn't heard before. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, digital happened, and these things kind of got swapped out for these other two things. And this became the focus um, around sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, and it has been the focus, I would say, up until about, you know, it still is, but maybe up until the last few years, it's, um, it's changed a bit. And 
Of course, audio and video, digital music, that changed the game massively. There were stores like iTunes that you know, broke ground there, and the iPod, and changing how people interacted with that, and actually putting files of music on your devices, and of course, streaming and all that other stuff that we know about. I don't need to tell you guys. And then data, of course, is the other big thing. Um, my example here, oh, I shouldn't stand in front of the screen, you can't see it, is the Echonest, who is arguably the best in the biz when it comes to music data. Um, and these two things kind of took center stage, um, and they took center stage in a way for a while there. I'm going to show you some stuff here for, s for a minute that like, you know, early on I found some old screenshots. Um, early on <laughs> in the days of digital music, stuff kind of looked like this. It didn't have much of a presentation layer to it, and it didn't have a lot of editorial to it either. Um, do you guys remember these things? These are like old. I dug these out of like my folders from 2006. Um, and I was working on something during this time as well, Last FM, which was also, um, you know, very focused around the audio and the visual and very much focused on data. And these things took center stage and that other stuff, the presentation layer and the sort of editorial focus really got shoved to the side for a while. Um, and then some more things happened. Well, presentation eventually got better because the industry matured and um, with that brought better design and better craft and now we have all sorts of really, really beautiful music services that look amazing and look just as good as the covers of Rolling Stone for sure. Um, and the other thing that happened is that audio and video just became a non-issue. Like we eventually solved the problems around that and we figured out how to make it work and no one thought about that anymore. I see there's some people standing at the back. If you want to come in, there's still plenty of space up here. If you want to sit down, don't be afraid. Come on in. It'll be more fun. Um, so that sort of left us with data and editorial as like the two things in our toolkit. And the interesting thing about these two things is they've been sort of, um, if you've been following what's been going on, they've been having a little bit of an argument lately. <laughs> um, in fact, I would say that for the last few years, there has been a panel about these two things at South by Southwest. And if there's another one this year, honestly, I'm going to like march in there and ask these people like what's going on. So this was 2012. It was like man versus the algorithm. 2013, we had it again, man versus the machine. 2014, I was there for this one this year. Um, and I think it really came to a head in 2014. This was sort of a watershed year for this particular conversation around which one is better. Is it the human curated editorial thing or is it this data and algorithm and computer thing? And we really saw that come out with this sort of like beats versus uh, you know other music services like Spotify uh, debate and stuff like that. Well guys, I'm here to tell you that there is no one versus the other. Um, there is both. And good design is about having as many tools in your toolkit as possible and using them appropriately. That's really important. A lot of people ask me, like, how do you design? What's the formula? What's the one, two, three step? There is no formula. There are no steps. All I can tell you is it's about putting all your sharpest tools in your toolkit and using them when it makes sense to do so. And sometimes that means it really makes sense to use editorial in the way that you're approaching your work. And sometimes it means it makes sense to use data. Sometimes it makes sense to use both. These four things here, these are your tools. Good presentation, beautiful imagery that connects with your audience, really easy to access and listen to audio and video, editorial if it makes sense to do so, and making use of our tools around data. And this requires quite a lot of knowledge for a designer. This means that you have to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and go talk to some other people in the industry that you might not normally talk to. It means, you know, really understanding how to source and present the way music looks, which is tricky. Like, you know, what kind of image APIs do you have access to, for instance? How do you use them? Um, it also requires some legal knowledge. You need to know how you're going to source those files or stream it. Um, it requires a little bit of editorial knowledge as well. Like, for instance, how is music journalism created? You know, how, what is the formula behind radio playlists? These are things that have existed for a long time. It doesn't make ch sense to just toss them out because we have this new model with computers. There's still some good stuff there to know about and make use of. And then, of course, technical knowledge. These are the four areas of your design toolkit for music. And when you put them all together, 
you can make things like this. Um, this is a newspaper that I made in 2010 for Last FM to commemorate the year in listening. And I worked with the data scientist there to make this really cool visualization of what music had been listened to and how it had changed over time. And then I also worked with a music journalist so that we could annotate this a little bit and give people some context around that data so they, they could really dig into it and understand the stories behind why people were listening to music. But let's talk about this technical knowledge for a bit. I want to just focus on that because this area in particular is the one that is ripe for experimentation. And whenever you have an area that's ripe for experimentation or changing things, um, it's also probably an area of many constraints. And that means it's an area of a lot of dialogue. Um, so as a designer, it's really important that you get to know the developers that you're working with and you really understand what data you have access to and what kind of APIs there are out there so that you can build the things you want to build. And basically, you know, all those technical terms really just boil down to a very simple, plain English sentence, which is like, here's the stuff you can get, Here's the format you can have it in, you know, and you can include these bits. Like, can I also please have, you know, the pictures or the dates or something like that? And there's a few questions that you should get comfortable asking up front, and these can solve a lot of problems for you down the road. So, like, what parameters can it have, for instance? What kind of bits can we have attached to this? Um, you know, how expensive is it to get this? This is something you should get used to if you haven't heard this before. Like, is it expensive to get that? information onto the page, will it take a long time? And then also, what can we compare it to? Because usually the best designs in music, the ones that are more most interesting are the ones where we're like showing you a comparison around some data, like for instance, here's all of your friends that have listened to the same thing that you have. That's actually really hard to do because you have to like calculate who your friends are and then take their music taste and you need to compare it against your own and then like what time range are you going to do that in, blah, blah, blah. So these are the kinds of things that you should start getting used to asking as a designer. And if the answer is no, my advice to you is, let me show you what I'm thinking. I have solved many debates like this where I've talked to developers and asked them, hey, can we do this thing? And they're like, no way, that's way too expensive. We can't do that, you're dreaming. And I'll go off and I'll draw some sketches or I'll make a little prototype or I'll put something together and then I'll wave it in front of them and be like, but you know, it could be really cool. It could look like this, it would be a great experience. And then that's usually enough to get people interested and motivated and excited to try and figure it out. And I'd say that like nine times out of 10 that works and you can usually break some pretty interesting ground that way. So don't forget that as a designer, a great tool in your toolkit is just the power of persuasion through what beautiful things you can make. Okay, and this is basically, you know, how you get from something like that, which as a designer you, le you learn how to read to Something like this, which is the last FM iPhone app that I worked on in, what do I mean, 2010, 11. So just really quickly, I want to mention um, something that I call the what, why brief. This is something that I use for all of my design, and this is a great tool. Um, it's basically what do you want and why do you want it? And the why, that's the bit that's so important because that's the bit that almost nobody knows and no one can tell you, and you are going to have to sleuth out. It's like detective work. Sometimes, you know, it's going to take some, lo some time to figure out why you want to do it. But once you figure out these two things, um, then it's your job as the designer to figure out how to do it. And you know, this is the bit that like, for you and your colleagues to choose how to do it. Um, and what I find is that often, especially when you're working with people for the first time, they kind of get these two things flipped around. And they come to me and they say, okay, um, this is what we're gonna do and this is how it's gonna work. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> stop. <laughs> first tell me what you want and why you want it, and then I'm gonna figure out how to do it. That's my job here. Um, and if people don't work with me like that, then I don't work with them. It's really that simple. But I find that this is an extremely great way to approach your problems. And also, it really helps you on the data side of things to not just sort of take something off the shelf and think about the how, the implementation detail first, but really focus on these other things. And so from here, I also want to talk about something that I heard mentioned once at South by Southwest, and I wish I could remember who it was because I've talked about this before and I love this concept and I use it all the time, which is 
called Turning the Creative Corner. When you're figuring out the what and the why, it's this bit down here. Let me see if I can like make a cool light. Ooh, check it out. It even matches. Um, this like investigation bit down here, right? And then at a certain point, you want to flip and you want to move to this production aspect, which is the how. And usually, the problems with creative teams happen when you have people on one side that are like, OK, so we got to get this done in like two days. And you're like, no, 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 no. This is like brainstorm time. Like, Let's focus on the what and the why. Or conversely, when you're like at the end of a project, and you're nearly finished, and everyone's putting the fit and finish and the polish on, and someone walks in, and they're like, you know, I was thinking, what if we? X, Y, Z, and you're like, okay, what, man? Like, are you serious? And so talking to your team about when you turn that creative corner, I find is one of the most useful tools as a designer that you can have in that tool belt of yours. Just being super clear and crisp with your team. When are we switching from this mode, this investigation mode, to this production mode? Because they're very different, and the questions that you ask are very different, and the way that you work is very different. And I'd say that about 50% of making is learning to ask the right questions at the right time. And then, of course, you do this over and over again because, as we know, um, things don't always work the first time and not all products are hits and things are bad ideas. <laughs> so I would really recommend that you learn how to ask these questions at the right time and focus on doing that with your team as well. OK, that's it for the tools. That was the longest part, so thanks for sticking with me through that. Let's talk about structure. So music, um, music has a really interesting structure to it, because just the taxonomy of music from an information design perspective, and when I say information design, I'm talking about like how do you organize metadata and information and things like albums and songs and videos and audio and release dates and all this kind of stuff. This is a big part of designing for music because as the designer on a project, all this stuff winds up on your plate and you need to figure out how to make it look beautiful and you need to ensure that people can navigate through it easily and that they can find what they're looking for. And also something interesting has been happening over the last few years, which is that this model here, um, which is currently up on the RDO Heavy Rotation page, but they just launched this new redesign today, so maybe that's going to change, um, uh, is very much based around albums. And this makes a lot of sense because albums have art, and that's something that you probably want as a designer, uh, is to put some imagery on here, and we'll get to that in a second. But the thing about albums is that um, if you talk to anybody who's younger than like 20 years old, uh, they don't listen to albums anymore, of course, right? We all know that. Um, they listen to songs. And so this is slowly starting to change. You know, uh, iTunes, for instance, used to be really, really albums focused. Everything was grouped under an album in terms of taxonomy as a, um, from a design perspective. But now they're trying to bubble up songs a little bit more. And you can see this with Spotify, too. And actually, I think this is a really great example of, what, uh, of the kind of stuff I want to know about here. This is an up and coming artist called Jungle. And um, there's popular tracks, which is the first thing I want here. And then there's some other stuff before I even get to the albums, which is like tour dates and merchandise, which is actually pretty neat. However, um, in terms of this taxonomy, you'll notice that like that little, we all know what this does up here, this launches the artist radio. Um, so this is interesting um, that I found this feature the other day, which is super buried, <laughs> in that you can actually start radio off a track, but it's just not that obvious. And I think this is an interesting I think this is a really interesting potential here because people are so much more focused on tracks these days. Uh, that's what they listen to and that's what they're interested in. Um, to be able to make this more prominent I think could be really neat. Of course, we all know what the best music network is for songs and it's the one that you know ostensibly isn't really even a music product, but that's YouTube. And of course, this, um, this has probably some of the best design patterns for finding songs of anything out there today. Um, you can get to the song that you want right away. Nothing is grouped under albums. It works really well for all the different types of songs that you have out there, remixes and classical music and hip hop and mixtapes and all this stuff. And there's really great related content. There is no concept of an album on YouTube. And I think that that 
in itself is a really interesting thing to be thinking about as a designer because for a lot of people today, the concept of an album doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them either. And that's also changing in just how music is released too. It's very interesting to see artists releasing their music on SoundCloud in sort of a more like a drip feed approach where it's track by track by track and then eventually it sort of gets um, you know pulled together in an album as opposed to a big album release all at once. So as a designer, you really need to think about how you're going to structure things so that if it changes in the future, it's easy for you to move out of a particular pattern into a new one because you can never predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, the other thing about <laughs> designing for music is um, that is some of these examples. So I've seen, I've seen something happen a lot when I work with uh, designers or I see comps for the first time, sort of like a composite image, um, where they do things that these designers have done here. And I should preface this part of this presentation by saying that I'm going to be doing a little bit of cr critique of other people's work, and I'm doing this out of, with nothing but respect for these designers, and I'm also critiquing my own work. So um, if anybody wants to talk more about this afterwards, I'd love to have a dialogue about it. Now, I've chosen all these examples uh, off Dribble, and these are all really lovely designs. They each have something about them that I really like. So this first one here, I mean, this is just a really cool idea for an interface. That's a really neat interaction. I love that. Um, this is pretty cool, the way that they're showing like a split image here. I've never seen that before. That's a nice little visual design touch that I like. Um, and this is just a really lovely, simple looking player with a really nice progress bar. It's actually hard to find really lovely, simple looking players. All these designs are really great, but they also all share something in common, which is that um, I think you would have a hard time fitting anything longer than Rihanna in there, and ditto with this. And this, you could probably fit that in there longer, but, you know, a lot of people are really picky about casing on their artist name or on their song name. That's something that you kind of have to respect. If an artist has chosen to write something all in lowercase, you, you kind of need to make sure that you write it in lowercase too as a designer. I think that's quite important. Um, and so if I was giving feedback on these, I would say these are really beautiful designs, but they need to maybe be a little bit more flexible to take into consideration all the stuff you have to deal with in music, which looks like this. You've got all sorts of different languages. So you have to get really, really comfortable with your Unicode knowledge. Um, you have all sorts of interesting accents, and if you're using special typefaces for your designs, you need to make sure that all those accents and characters look good in that typeface or that it has support for them, or if not, there's some fallbacks, which is a whole interesting ball of wax in itself. Um, you have stuff like this, which is the search still needs to work if the user types it in and doesn't include the accents in there. That's something that I see all the time. So you search BJO, and then the first thing that pops up is with the O with the two dots over the top of it. Um, this is one of my favorite test cases of all time. I always usually comp up my designs with, and you will know us by the Trail of the Dead, because this is just such a damn long artist name. It never fits in anything, but check it out. Spotify has done a lovely job of making sure that that fits in there. Um, there's also stuff like this, you know, especially in dance music, like, look at this, it's always like remix with lots of people, featuring, produced by, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is a screenshot from Ardeo, they've also done a really nice job of making sure that all fits in there nicely. Um, this is on Mixcloud, so they've done a nice job here of ensuring that that uh, that those characters are about the same weight typographically as the Latin characters, which isn't something you always see. Often it defaults back to something that is like spindly and doesn't look the same or doesn't have the same texture typographically. Um, so that's pretty cool. And, you know, there's other stuff like certain genres have very, very, dis you know, special kinds of cases that you need to think about. So for instance, in the hip hop world with mixtapes, there's lots of stuff there, different types of metadata that you might need to think about that you wouldn't if you're doing something else. Or, um, you know, stuff like this. Uh, people title their own tracks and then you wind up with this as your metadata. And if you're pulling that in off an API or something and making that appear in your product, that's something that you're gonna have to deal with and figure out how to filter out of there. Um, and then of course, there's basically, you know, the most difficult uh, metadata pile ever, which is classical music, because of all of the 
different things that you have to deal with for that specific genre. So this is just a little bit of a glimpse into the world of information design if you're working on music products. It's a lot, it's a lot more to think about and to deal with than, than something else out there. Music is really messy, but you know what? That's what makes it great. That's what makes music really, really fun. And my advice to you as a designer is just embrace that mess, just get into that chaos, just learn how to roll with it because you're never going to be able to make things neat. You're never really going to be able to make things um, super clean and you probably wouldn't want to either because I mean, music isn't really neat and clean. I, I can't think of any music that is really. It doesn't make sense. Um, and also, you know, in terms of like taxonomy and how things are organized, like your users might have ideas how to organize things too. And that's something that you should just let happen. So here's some great examples um, from Twitter, which were the hashtag and the app message. You guys probably know all about the, the, the beginnings of these things, so I don't need to tell you, but they were invented by users. And that was something that Twitter em embraced and adopted. And they were like, cool, we're gonna roll with this. We're gonna make this part of our product. And that's really, really neat. Um, another example is, um, on Last FM, when I was working on it, the witch house tag was emerging during that time. And that was a really interesting thing to see happen because, um, you know, we had this character support. They started using these interesting, um, interesting characters to tag the music with to make it findable inside that place where the whole point of it was that it wasn't going to be findable. So, you know, you should really think about how people might want to use stuff outside of the existing structure and taxonomy of music. Um, also, there's this sort of like bit about, I guess like the serendipity of finding things. It's usually not what you think it is. Like it's not the other songs on the album or it's not necessarily like a related song, but often it's something that's a little bit more off in the distance that you wouldn't have expected. And at Last FM, our sort of like holy grail of uh, navigation was this over here, these similar artists. So what would happen is people would search for um, an artist and then they would land on one of these artist screens and then they'd use the similar artist to navigate around. And that was the most important thing. That was the thing that we never, <laughs> you know, never wanted to screw up. Whenever we changed anything, that was the first stat that we looked at because that was one of the most important navigation um, navigation things. And another example here is how, you know, history can actually be really important. Now you can see some really embarrassing history from some stuff I was searching on on Spotify on my phone. But this history is navigation, right? I was like, oh yeah, what was that that I was listening to the other day? And then pull up your search history and bam, there it is. This is something that's really often overlooked in music. And it's not necessarily just about new album releases or you know, artists and songs. Um, there's other ways to group things and cluster things so that people can find from one to the other. And they usually lurk in the corners around like similarity and time and things like that. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, this is my jam. So we um, approached this very differently. We decided from the get-go with jam that we were gonna make a service that was completely built around songs and has nothing to do with albums whatsoever. We were like, let's just make this all about songs. So that's it, songs and artists. Um, and so what we do is we let you share your favorite song. We make it really beautiful and big so that it's more than just like a single little line in the track listing, um, give you a whole screen for it and we share it to the places that you would share it to anyway. And then what happens is because every song is really carefully handpicked by people, because we ask you, what's your favorite song right now? Um, we wind up with this really rare catalog of basically what's just the best songs of all time. So it's not a large catalog, it's a very small catalog, but it's just the best stuff. And our focus is really on cutting through all of the choice out there in music today. Um, this is a little bit more of what it looks like. So we um, just recently put out a new feature, which are these song screens. So we took all the jams that we had collected, all the data, um, we deduped de them and figured out how many songs there were out there. And we came up with these sort of like five, point, uh, half a million new song screens um, that had a lot of rich new interactions on them. And this is what they look like. They just launched last week. Um, so we pull in audio from different sources. Um, I'm gonna talk you through some of the design of this because this is one of the more challenging projects that I worked on and you'll find out in a second. So we wanted to make this really visual. So let's try and pull in some imagery from a jam and put it up at the top of the screen here. Um, again, questions around typography. So ensuring that this looks good in every language. Um, 
this is a really great example of the type of like serendipity or type of navigation people might want to have. So instead of saying, you know, this is exactly what the next thing it's going to be, you can sometimes just like hint at what the next thing is going to be. So we're using the artist as a way to hint at what the next song would be instead of the song name. And that actually piques people's interest a little bit more than the song itself. Um, we do some nice sort of like uh, color stuff here to make the player look the same color. Whoops, sorry. Um, let's try this again. There we go. Using a clicker. I can do it. Um, and then we pull in all this information about people and what they're saying about this song. And this is a whole screen just dedicated to that song. This project was really challenging because the colors change per song, the players change per song. Um, there's audio, there's video, there's different sizes. Um, there's all sorts of different lengths of text. Um, there's different people that show up on here, whether you have friends or if you don't, or how big your network is, or whether there's comments or no comments, or it's brand new. And these are the kinds of things that you need to think about if you're designing products um, that have any kind of user-generated content in music. OK, let's move on to context. How are you guys doing? You still with me? You're awake? OK, good. I see there's some people at the back. Do you want to come sit down? No? OK, you're like, we might want to leave. That's cool. I get it. It's fine. OK, context. So um, with some emoji on it, because I love them. Oh, yeah, you came and sat down. Hi. OK, so context with music. Um, we're in a really interesting space right now, I think, because song sharing, uh, just to continue with this example, is something that I think at the moment is still pretty largely fragmented. Because people do this all the time. We see it on all of these services. We see people sharing their favorite songs on uh, Twitter or obviously making playlists on Spotify, which I do all the, all the time, or even less so now, but I think in the last few years, there was a lot of interest into sort of like, how do we show what people are listening to in real time? And while this is all really great, it's still feels to me like it's fragmented across a lot of different services, and this stuff also kind of disappears. Um, it's very ephemeral, so if someone shares a great track on Twitter, when I want to go listen to it later, it's gone, it's dropped off the end of the feed, it's disappeared. And you see this all the time. In fact, the other night while I was writing this, um, uh, someone that I follow on Twitter said this really lovely thing about something that she was listening to, and you can see here she's like really trying to you know, set the context for what this song is all about. Like, here's here's what you should do before you listen to it. This is the frame of mind. This is the mood. Because there's no other way to do that on Twitter. Like, words are all you have there, right? Um, and then also her context around it. So, like, this is this is her memory of that song, which is, like, one of the most beautiful things about music ever, as we all know. Um, but still, today, this is kind of, this is a bit of a problem, I think. And that's one of the main reasons that we made This Is My Jam, which was, to try and give a better home for these kinds of songs and give a place for people to write these stories and add some context and, you know, maybe instead of telling people to open all their windows, put a picture of a window on there instead um, to add a little bit of mood. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did that and the story behind it because um, this was a really tricky project. So when we started Jam, we just let people post a Jam. We let them do it really quickly, and we were thinking of it in terms of a status update. But then as we talked to more users and did research and interviews, we discovered that actually people really did want to make it beautiful and add some of these stories to it. And so we thought, OK, let's see if we can change this flow and make it um, something that has a little bit more friction so that they put this stuff into it. And so we changed it from a one-step flow to a three-step flow. And something really interesting happened here. We ended up getting a lot more jams with written descriptions, which was great, because that was one of the things that we were solving for at the beginning of this project. And also, the number of jams posted didn't change. That's good. That means we didn't fuck anything up. Um, but going back on it and looking at this now, sort of like a year on, I do wonder like if this was necessarily the best path. And we might actually change this again in the future, um, because you have to experiment with these things. But it's a tricky balance because for some people, adding this information like the context and images and stories is something they really, really want to do. But for a lot of other people, they just want to post it really quickly and get it over with. Um, so that's my critique of my own project right there. But this is, um, this is one of the sort of difficult things that you have to design for in that people have very different ways that they think about music and how they share it. And um, your audience, while everybody might like sharing songs, might split out vastly amongst sort of who creates that content, who, who doesn't necessarily want to do it quite so much. Um, 
these are some examples of emails. I'm really into emails right now. Um, I'm really into emails because they show up directly on my phone and I can click links and I can check stuff right away. And I think that we're probably seeing a little bit of a resurgent of emails right now. Um, I also think that people are just kind of maybe getting a little bit sick of like refreshing feeds all the time and there's something quite nice and old school about this in sort of a cool way. So. These three emails are three that I absolutely love. Um, the first one is Hype Machine has this new product called Stack, which I think just came out like maybe a month or two ago or something, where they pull five of their favorite songs that week, I think, and create a little bit of context around it. So tell you like why these things are important, why you should listen to them. Um, the Fader does a daily email, which is amazing. It's got tons of context around all this stuff, which makes sense because they're editorial. And then there's this Stone's Throne newsletter, which is like my absolute favorite email from a record label ever. I only get it like maybe once a month or every two months they send it out. But when they do, it's like, here's some stuff to listen to. Here's some tour dates. Here's a video. It's like, how could I not love this? It's just great. Um, but the thing that all of these have in common is they're doing a really great job of contextualizing the music and explaining to me, like, why should I listen to this? Why should I care about it? What sort of frame of mind do I need to be in to want to listen to this stuff? And that's something that in a lot of music services you don't see so much. Um, and I think there's definitely something interesting to dig into here. The other thing about music is that there's just some really basics around context that you have to consider, which is it takes three and a half minutes to listen to a song. You need some headphones, you need some speakers, you need the right kind of frame of mind. Um, so these are some you know, crappy sketches that I drew for a project that I was working on once around playlists, but the point of this was to illustrate to the people I was working with on that team, like, look, these are the types of contexts in which people listen to playlists. And so that's how we have to design for them, because a lot of times um, I see that you know people just sort of pick up on other design patterns out there and maybe try and stuff music into a model that makes sense for social like you know sharing a song on Twitter for instance like Twitter moves by very quickly because it's chat and you know talking is very fast and it's very easy to read it only takes a couple of seconds you can scroll through it immediately I don't necessarily need to have my headphones plugged in that's a totally different context and scenario than like sitting down and listening to people's favorite songs for instance Another example around context is this project I worked on at Last FM, which was for Xbox Connect. Yeah, I know, right? So this was cool and kind of weird at the same time, um, and it all had to do with context. On one hand, it's like, great, you know, Last FM radio on my TV, that makes so much sense if you have a TV. I personally don't, but I think that for people who do have TVs, you know, it's the center of their home entertainment system, and having music come out of it with a really nice, beautiful visual while it's playing is great. But on the other hand, it's like the context around using something like Connect to play music is just utterly strange. And when I was working on this project, you know, we had all these gestures that we had to deal with here, which was like, you have to hold your hand up and like wait for it to select something and stuff. And I was just like, no one's ever going to do this because who wants to stand like this? I mean, I've been standing like this for a while now and my hand's getting sore. Um, but there was something about this that was neat that we took advantage of, which is there was this uh, microphone feature. And so we worked really hard to get these microphone bits into the project, even though we didn't have that much time for it. Um, I really prioritized it because the idea of being able to say like, you know, um, <laughs> something like this, it, it was actually a cartoon that was made about it, you know, Xbox Next, previous, and just talking to the thing to get it to play music makes loads more sense contextually than standing there with your hand up. And you know, in the right context, great music products sometimes don't even need music. That's another thing to think about. Um, you know, this is a great product. This is really fun. If you haven't played with it yet, you definitely should. Drake Shake uh, puts a photo of Drake into your own photos. And this picture here is of Drake actually using Drake Shake himself, which I kind of love. It's like, it's like double Drake. <laughs> okay. All right. So fourth, look and feel. Um, this is, this is probably. Um, one of the more important topics, because this is going to be the front door of your of your work, right? This is the first thing that people say see. And I love this quote here by one of my favorite designers, Bruno Minari. If you haven't heard of him, you should read some of his books. He's excellent. 
He says a designer is a planner with an aesthetic sense. And that's so important. If you're the kind of designer that doesn't have an aesthetic sense, then you definitely need to be working with one who does so that you can ensure that your product really looks and feels great because it's so critical for music. Um, Music is one of those things, unlike some other domains, that has all of these beautiful, amazing, fantastic visuals attached to it that change pop culture and fashion and street style and the way that we view all sorts of things. And it's all tied up together in a really wonderful area. And this requires actually having quite a lot of what we would call industry or domain knowledge. In technology, we say domain knowledge sometimes. And what I mean by this is, if you are designing for music, it's actually really important that you are a part of that music industry and that you know, like you really know, like what music is cool right now and what genres people are listening to and like even what's in the charts or what isn't. Like you really have to understand it because if you don't, I think you risk potentially alienating people who could be early adopters of your service. And here's why. Early adopters are people who really know music. They're music lovers like us. They know absolutely everything about anything that's going on in the industry, and they're going to be the first people to try out your product, usually. But if you aren't designing from a place of sort of understanding that, then often stuff can happen where you just use examples that perhaps maybe don't make a lot of sense or um, could rub people the wrong way. I'm going to quickly quickly pick on this one here for a second. So I got this in my inbox yesterday. It came from a music service, which I really respect, and I think they do great work. But they emailed me about Maroon 5, and that was their featured artist of the week. And, you know, I get it. A lot of people listen to Maroon 5. They're very popular. But in terms of appealing to tastemakers or people that really get music and love music and, and showing that they understand people who really love music, I'm not sure that this is the best approach. Um, and to illustrate this, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and show you a blog post that I wrote last week when we um, released the song graph stuff on This Is My Jam, and I actually took the time and energy to try and write a little bit about this particular kind of music and pull some examples that I thought were relevant and interesting and in a few different categories. And I'm not a music journalist. I don't even know the first thing about how you describe music with words, but I did some research and I looked around and I have some friends who are music journalists, so I ran it by them. And you know, I feel like something like this shows like we care about music, we understand music, and that's something that this is my jam, we work really hard to try and project. That we're not just technology people, that we're not just a designer and developers, but that we are people who truly love and understand music and that we can really connect with our audience who are also music lovers and early adopters. I think this goes a long way in terms of gaining empathy for your audience. The other thing about look and feel is that Music for a long time kind of came with these built-in visuals, like beautiful record sleeves, you know, tickets from concerts, stuff like that. But as soon as it became digital, um, it was just a file. That's it. It was basically just a file. So as a designer, it's only as visual as you choose to make it. And this was something that I came up against when I first started working at Last FM. Okay, so this is a screenshot from like the Internet Archive <laughs> from like 2000 and or something, I don't even know. Um, but this is what I had to start with when I first started working there. This is what I was given. They were like, Hannah, can you please make this better? And I was like, yeah, well, there's no pictures on here, basically. And music is a very visual thing. Like, that's how you know what kind of mood it is and what it looks like and what it's going to maybe even sound like. And so we had to work really hard to figure out how to put pictures in. At the time, that was actually really difficult because there was... Um, there was no good image APIs, and also it was really loady on the pages, um, but we did manage to figure it out. And so uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when I redesigned the This Is My Jam Explore page, um, this is what I did, which felt like a really nice thing to be able to do after all that time. The other thing you need to think about with look and feel is something that I would call genre agnosticism. So. SoundCloud. This is a really old screenshot. You guys might have remembered what it looked like back then. Um, I've always been a huge fan of SoundCloud. They're great. Um, but I remember looking at this uh, back in like 2008 or something and thinking, hmm, you know, it really looks like electronic music to me. 
And that makes sense because they come from Berlin and I think early on their audience was very electronic. Um, and something that the designers there have done a really great job of is moving from it looking very electronic to much more genre agnostic. This is what it looks like today on iPhone. It's really beautiful and when you're playing hip hop on it, it looks like it fits, like it makes sense. It doesn't feel like you're shoving hip hop into something that looks like it's built for electronica. And that's hugely important. If you're building a service from the beginning that's supposed to encompass a lot of different genres, it's really necessary that as a designer you put different metadata in and you put different images in and you think like how would this look and feel with different kinds of music in there and come up with some style guides for how it can be genre agnostic. Um, here's another example of imagery. So Spotify has recently been really busy redesigning a lot of stuff and it's been looking awesome. I love a lot of the things that they're doing. And they've also been humanizing it, I think, which is really interesting to see because it never used to have that many pictures of people in it. Um, but now they're starting to use a lot more pictures of people and it feels more emotional and it's really nice. Um, <laughs> but there's some still some things that just I'm confused by. <laughs> this is the bottom of this very beautiful page, which is a glass of orange juice and a moleskine. And I don't know what that has to do with music at all. I mean, it maybe looks like design, <laughs> but it doesn't look like music. And these are things that you need to be incredibly conscientious of when you design for music. Um, also, I would say, basically, never use a picture of girl with headphones on your product, ever. You laugh, you laugh, but you know, me and my friends, we have this running joke called uh, girl with headphones where we just email each other, you know, hilarious new examples of products that pop up pretty much every week um, with girls with headphones on them, and this exists. But here are some great examples. I love Drip FM. This looks like music. I love the kind of stuff that's happening on the new uh, Pitchfork cover stories. Um, even Medium, you know, does a really great job of contextualizing it and making it look awesome. And this is something that has been happening in music pretty much forever. People have been turning it into what they want to look like, even on Facebook, where there barely is any place to customize it, they're putting up their favorite music. And it's also something that we worked really hard on with This Is My Jam, which is how do we ensure that people get to really visualize the music that the way that they want. And it was quite a lot of alchemy, actually, because we only had <laughs> some pretty rough images to go by. And I sort of investigated what's interesting right now in pop culture, and we took these YouTube thumbnails, and we put some processing on them, and we changed them, and we made it so that we could come up with something much more beautiful than the, um, the sum of the parts, I think. Okay, interactions. I'm running a little bit over because we got started really late, and I see you said five minutes there at the back. Is it okay if I just take a bit more time? You guys cool to sit here? Five minutes, okay. I'm gonna run through this really quickly, and if anybody has any questions at the end, just come up and talk to me, okay? All right, so the last one here is these, this holy trinity or this triad of interactions. Um, so playback, uh, first of all, there's a few things you need to know. There's things like embedded players. This is one I just built actually the other week. We built a new one for these SoundCloud pages, um, you know, that just is a really, really simple, uh, easy sort of like embedded player. But the other thing, besides embedded players, is you also need to consider what happens when people switch from one page to the other. I think Hype Machine was probably the first site that ever did this. It's obviously much easier on devices, um, but you do it using the HTML5 history handler, and that's something that you should be aware of as a designer. How do you ensure that the music doesn't stop when you're designing flows? Um, Something else about playback, this just uh, launched today, I believe. I grabbed this screenshot this morning after I saw that RDO had redesigned. And what they're focusing on is this sort of lean back and lean in approach to listening to music, which the idea is, is that if you're playing it on your phone, that's very different from if you want to sit back and put it on your TV screen, you know, like maybe like the Connect project. In terms of socializing, um, I've done a lot of interviews with people on music and they always say that their best music recommendations come from friends and it's about three to five people, or one to five people rather. And this is why music discovery is actually quite a lot of work and you really need to make it easy for your users. This is a project that I worked on in 2010 called My Mix Radio where we kind of took some of the formulas of radio DJs and thought about how do you um, help people discover music in a way that isn't just new stuff all the time because that's actually way too much work for people. They don't like that at all. They like to listen to existing stuff with a little bit of new mixed in. And um, 
the other thing about socializing and discovery is that if you ask people really pointed questions, it tends to result in better content and better conversation. And this was um, something that my co-founder, Matthew Ogle, did when we were starting This Is My Jam. We were doing a lot of sort of tests and conversations in pubs. And we asked people this question about, you know, what song should I listen to? And we found out that the quality of music went way up, but also the quality of the conversation went way up too. So pointed questions and things that people can easily answer are really good for this. And those are some of the comments that we got, which are pretty nice. Okay, so to wrap up here, I'm nearly done. I'll just quickly run through some of these points. First of all, music is really hard. You know, it's not for the faint of hearted. Go into it knowing this. Secondly, to always use the best tool for the job. It's not about trends or dogma. Just pick the right one out of your tool belt. Thirdly, music is really messy. That's the way it is. So plan for it, embrace it, and get comfortable with that chaos. Also, music requires the right kind of context and constraints to be enjoyed. It's not necessarily something that makes sense to fit into the patterns of social media or networking. And it also represents this whole world of pop cultural and visuals, and it thrives on that language. And digital music is only as visual as you make it, so as the designer, it's your job to ensure that you can translate that somehow to the user. And lastly, you know, design from sort of like day one for this interlinked triad of music interactions, because without listening, you can't have discovery, and without discovery, you can't have socializing. Those three things are what music wants, that's what it's always been about, and you need to design for those things up front. But to end, perhaps most importantly here, this doesn't seem to want to click, there we go. I think that we have an amazing potential right now to make music products more than something that just changes behavior, more than just changes how we listen to music or how we interact with it on a daily basis, but something that can really amplify and create music culture. And that's something that I'm pretty excited about seeing over the next few years as we get more comfortable with things like data and editorial living side by side and the industry matures more and we see more beautiful designs coming out of it because I think it will become something that can really amplify music culture the way that it has in the past. And that's it. If you guys have questions, come up and say hi. I'd love to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.